Hello, I'm Michael Steinmacher, Director of the Barr Memorial Library at Fort Knox, Kentucky. Tonight, we're honored to be speaking with number one New York Times bestselling author, Martin Dugard. Tonight, he's going to be talking about his new book, Taking Paris. He is the co-author of the Killing series with Bill O'Reilly, the author of To Be a Runner, and also included in his books are The Murder of King Tut, which he co-authored with James Patterson, and Into Africa. Mr. Dugard, thank you and welcome. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. So what I thought we would do tonight is um, I've got a series of questions here, and anybody that has a question can jump on in and add it in the chat, and we'll get to those as well. But first of all, could you tell us a little bit about Taking Paris? Sure. It's uh, it's the story of the occupation of Paris beginning May 10th, 1940, when the when the uh, when the Germans invaded France and eventually marched into Paris a month later, um, all the way to August 26, 1944, when when the Allies you know liberated the city. And it's it's not just your standard World War II you know history book. It's 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 full of rich detail. It's got some very very deeply researched stuff. But I wanted to write a book that was um, not an academic treatise, but an actual thriller. I wanted to tell the story in a very fast-paced, page-turning way. So we 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 have all these great characters, and we've got George Patton and Winston Churchill and the French Resistance, and you know spies and heroes and villains. But I also wanted to write it in a way that when people read the book, they would they would read it maybe in one sitting or two sittings. It's just one of those books that you just didn't want to put down. So where did the idea come from for doing this book? You know, um, actually it it. My wife and I were in Italy. We were on vacation, and we went to uh, Anzio Beach. We just kind of stumbled into it, which was the site of an Allied landing in uh, 1943, 1944. And uh, we we went to the the cemetery there, the the American cemetery there for the for the people who had fallen in that battle. And I, I thought to myself that I would like to write about that. It seemed very fascinating to me, and people hadn't really done it. But then as I went through the process of researching it, I thought to really give it context, I had to kind of go all the way back to May 10th and what the Germans did and tell the whole story about why we eventually found ourselves at, at Anzio with, with the British and, and, you know, under the direction of Churchill. And then kind of Paris took over the whole story. And I realized that if I want to do the narrative kind of with complete context, Anzio wasn't the focus. It was a, it was a great, uh, it was a great endeavor, but the the focus really was eventually shifted back to D-Day and then and then the liberation of Paris, and so what began as a very small story became something very big, very iconic, very cinematic, um, something that I really had to kind of research, you know, very several different theaters of the war. So it really took on a big sprawling feel, and it was kind of fun to write like that. It's nice to write a big. A big story that demands uh, to be told with a lot of um, a lot of big set pieces, but also a lot of uh, action and some very personal moments that kind of bring out the resonance to the story. So I've got to admit, while I was waiting for uh, uh, Taking Paris to come out, I thought I would warm up by li I listened to Killing Patton, and oh, I'm right. curious. I'm curious, knowing that you know, with the overlap here with Patton appearing both in this book and in Killing Patton. How did this book, was this book informed by your past World War II work? Well, here's the thing. When, when you write about something as big as World War II, you know, and, and I've written about uh, the European theater, I've written about the Pacific theater, what you find is it's such a, you know, and it, it sounds kind of silly to, to have to point this out, but it's such a, a big thing that you can't know everything. And so, if, you know, for instance, with Killing Patton, the focus began, you know, in September 1944. We're in Metz, France, which was kind of the old Maginot line. Paris is trying to, Paris is, uh, Patton is trying to take Metz and then kind of move on towards Germany. And when I wrote that, it was just nice. It was kind of like my entree into the Patton world. And I learned a little bit about, you know, tanks and Patton and strategy through that. But, and I've done this with several other historical figures throughout the years sometimes and they just pop up in different books and in Patton I didn't write this book with the intention of writing about George Patton but he makes an appearance and all of a sudden he became more and more of a figure so 
it kind of helps you piece the historical pieces together to know, okay, Patton did this in late 1944, but what did he do before that? What did he do when he first came into, into France in, in July and August 1944? And in in what part did he play in the, in the liberation of Paris? And I think the difference is with this, we're showing a different side of Patton. We're showing a little bit more of the, the uncertain Patton, the, the romantic Patton, uh, the individual who um, has these great aspirations, but at the same time is kind of deeply insecure and flawed. And we don't really point that out in Killing Patton as much as we pointed out in, in uh, Taking Paris. So you mentioned earlier about your work and the idea that um, you wanted this to be a little bit different type of history for people to, to read. Can you tell us about how you approach your work and um, your approach to history is unique. So tell us about how you kind of go about the, the art of taking historical facts and crafting your work. <laughs> That's a good point. That's a good way to look at it. Um, I start with the overarching narrative. You know, let's, let's say May 10th, 1942, August 26, 1944. And so I'll kind of learn kind of the broader brushstrokes of that. I'll, I'll read a few books. I'll take a few trips. I'll just kind of, kind of touch, dip my toe in the water a little bit. And then when I go back to actually begin writing the book and telling the story, I literally take it not just chapter by chapter to tell the story. And I like to work in chronological fashion. because so I think if you work that way, it helps the reader keep track a little bit easier. Um, but I don't write chapter by chapter so much as I write literally uh, sentence by sentence, word by word. And, and I'll start with an opening sentence. I know where I'm going and then I'll fill in more detail. And it's a, it's a daily process of putting maybe a thousand words on the page and I print it out. And every morning when I get up, um, I read it aloud before I start the next day to see what works and where I kind of stumble a little bit. And then I'll edit on the page and I go back and fix that. And then we kind of pick up the story again the next day. I don't look too far ahead. I mean, I know where I'm going to end. I knew eventually we would get to Paris. I knew that was going to happen, but I didn't know who I was going to meet along the way. And, and, and if you leave yourself open like that, you end up meeting a lot of really interesting characters, which is why I'd, I'd, I have a, a rough outline in my head. I know a lot of people like a very rigid outline, but I like to be open to the, the idea that there might be a tangent, there might be a diversion that might enrich the story. And you and if you do that, you find these little historical nuggets that really make the, re the, the characters come, come alive. And I think it makes it a lot more fun. Can you tell us about what you hope that readers experience as they read one of your books? How, what kind of, um, what kind of ride, for lack of a better word, do you <laughs> want them to go on? I love that word. That is a great word. Um, I'm a complete history geek. I, I love history and I feel like um, the way that history is most often told um, in, in books in particular, um, makes history boring and dry and, and something where you just maybe read two or three pages and you put it down because you're falling asleep. And I like to write history in a way that makes people like history as much as I do. You know, if, if I have a, you know, for instance, if I have a favorite band that I like and I might, you know, play that music for a friend to just to hoping that they may might like that music as much as I like it. Well, it's the same thing with history because I love history. I want people to enjoy history and, um, and enjoy the nuances of history and enjoy the, the passion of history. And, and as much as I do. And, and I think one of the great crimes about the way history is usually written is history is bigger and better and more sprawling and more interesting and more exciting, uh, more passionate, more romantic than any fiction book. You know, but at the same time, when most people write history, they don't look for those things. They just want to put a bunch of facts on the page and expect the reader to go along. And I'm basically I'm telling history is a story and I'm telling that story and I'm doing it with all the detail that I can research that will bring out all the richness of this tapestry. I'm glad you said research because that obviously is going to be a, a key to all of your work. Can you tell us a little bit about the research that you specifically did for this book? Well, this was different. You know, usually I start my research by 
taking a few trips, like I just said. I mean, for instance, like last week, I was back in Europe researching the next book in the Taking series, which will come out next September. And so that's how I usually start every research process. You know, I, I go to the battlefields. I go to, you know, for instance, with Killing Patton, you know, I went to Fort Driant and I, you know, I went into this this old German fort that still exists and kind of made my way around. And then, you know, you smell the air, you eat the local food, you really get a feel for what's going on. And, you know, you visit all these sites and you learn the topography. Well, I couldn't do that with taking Paris because of COVID. And so um, as a journalist, I covered the Tour de France for 10 years. So I spent a considerable amount of time in, in Paris and the outlying city. So I had notes to guide me about the, you know, the, the lay of the land, so to speak. But for the most part, my research was, um, a re it, it's almost like if you, you hear about people who lose their, their hearing, all of a sudden their other senses become much more uh, well-informed. Well, it's the same with this, because I couldn't do the travel, all the other aspects of my research got much more attention. So, um, for instance, you know, if I'm just describing what the weather was like on a certain day, that meant literally going and finding historical weather data about Paris or some other city, you know, what the temperature was, what the what the rainfall was like, um, anything else like that. You know, I've, I learned about, I went through archives and I learned about, you know, like Winston Churchill's daily schedule, who he was meeting with, and all these little arcane bits of data, 90% of which don't get used, but it's, it's this nonstop deep dive into, you know, what are people wearing? What are they eating? Um, uh, are they tired, you know, I mean, because maybe they, they've been fighting a battle and they're up all night, you know, all these things, you know, what is life inside in a tank that is on, that is on the move? All these little bits of data. I mean, there's, you know, I'm kind of jumping around here, but there's a, there's a scene in the book where, you know, Patton is with a bunch of other aspiring generals in, uh, in, in Louisiana during maneuvers. And they're having that they're in this basement in, in this high school, having a, a secret meeting about the future of, of American armor. And, it's, and it's, it, the easy thing to do is to say they're meeting in the basement. And I thought, we can do better than that. And so I found the name of the high school. I found out the fact that the high school was was very expensive to build. They, you know, hearts of pine floors. They had Tiffany and company designing all the, the lamps and other fixtures. And once you start finding little things like that, all of a sudden you're not just meeting in a basement. You're meeting in this lavish limestone school with all these accoutrement. And, and then you're descending into a, a place with just piles of textbooks and cleaning supplies. And then, you know, then what goes on in the room, people are smoking, people, you know, they're smoking cigars, they're smoking cigarettes. You've got this conversation, you know, it's the end of a long day, they've been on maneuvers all day, so they're sweaty and they're tired. They're having this discussion late at night. And the more you dig and dig and dig and dig, that's when you get this full three-dimensional uh, setting that you can describe and that you can build a story around. So I'm curious how your process differs when you're working with a collaborator, whether it be James Patterson or Bill O'Reilly. Do how does that work? Everybody is different. I've I've ghosted on a few books. Um, I've written you know, worked work with Jim Patterson. Jim has a real easy process. He basically sends you a topic and an outline, and and says basically send me three chapters a month and he edits it when you send it to him and he sends them back and then you just kind of build a book that way with with bill and i we have a much different process where he comes up with the topic um i'll do the research i'll begin writing i will literally research and write a chapter i will email it to bill bill will print it out again read it aloud to hear what it sounds like what works then he'll rewrite it in his own voice and then he'll edit maybe asking me for more research or you know take out some stuff because we have too much research and then we do this back and forth on the telephone where we literally go through the book line by line by line and you know editing and collaborating to form the narrative it, it it's a it's worked it's worked for 18 million books it's worked for 12 years um and i think that's the best way to build a book other people like to collaborate differently, but I I feel like you know we, we certainly don't need to be in the same room at all the time. Bill and I have probably only been in the same place, maybe ten times. You know, for the, and yeah. we've never worked in the same place. We we everything we do is is by telephone, so it it's different. It's it's just different. But um, the, I I enjoy the collaboration process. But I will say, writing taking Paris, 
Um, it was weird at first because I, I hadn't written anything in my own voice since we began the Killing series. And, you know, that was 2010. And so I'd had someone to bounce ideas off of. So for the first time in forever, I'm writing without having someone to bounce ideas off of. And so that voice that was reading the stuff aloud every day, that's my voice. And I, I had to make all the hard decisions about what stays and what goes and what's next. Um, it's a little bit terrifying it's, and it's a little bit frightening, but at the same time, uh, it's immensely rewarding because as you go through the process, your own voice comes out and you, in you know, the killing series in, in, in taking Paris are similar in their pacing and their style. But I, I think when you read them side by side, the killing books are very much Bill's voice and taking Paris is very much my voice. Uh, but they're both very fast paced and they're bo both uh, designed to get people to, to read the entire book and read it in a hurry. You know, it's it's interesting you were saying about reading it out loud and how you do that in the collaborative way and how you were doing that yourself for taking Paris. Is that something that you had done before the co the collaborative work that you were reading your stuff out loud to yourself? No, it, you know, it, it was um, and shame on me because it, it it is one of the best things a writer can do. Um, I, I, every now and then I teach at the, one of the local universities, I teach a writing class and, and that's what I tell my students is you, the, one of the best things you can do is, and, and don't read off of your computer screen, actually print the document out, hold it in your hands and read it with a pencil in your hand and just make notations about where you stumble, um, what flows, what words kind of seem awkward. And it's a, it's a great discipline. And it, it um, and I, I find that the more I do it, the more I want to um, kind of kind of focus on that aspect of it. Because what happens is that the the chapter you're writing, if you start reading out loud, it becomes a speech all to itself. And just like in any speech, just like one of Churchill's speeches, you find yourself busting and editing over the delivery, and it just it really translates onto the page. I, I can't say that enough. It's it's immensely satisfying. How do you choose your subjects? Uh, <laughs> I like to travel. So uh, I pretty much choose them based upon the next place I want to go. So when I wrote Into Africa, which is about Stanley Livingston, I wanted, I'd never seen a lion in the wild and I wanted to go, you know, visit the great savannas of Africa. So I wrote a book about Africa. Um, with Christopher Columbus, I had never really spent time in the Caribbean and I wanted to go to the Caribbean. In, so I wrote, you know, it's kind of, it's a little bit self-indulgent, but it's a, uh, it's a whole lot of fun. It's one of the great perks of being a writer and, and getting to chart your own course. So since you, you spend quite a bit of your time working with history, historical facts, so on and so forth, I'm curious if you could go back in time and tell you, yourself at the beginning of your career, something you'd like them to know, what would it be? Well, you know, my, my story is that I, I didn't start out to be a writer, you know, I just, I took forever to finish college and I took the first corporate job that came along because I was newly married and we had, you know, children coming. And, um, but as soon as I became, uh, you know, working, you know, started working in the corporate world, I knew I was not cut out for that. I just, I couldn't see myself doing that for the rest of my life. So I began writing on the side and, and after three or four years of, of just doing, you know, magazine work and, and just kind of building up my brand and starting to write for, you know, bigger magazines like Sports Illustrated and Esquire. Um, I finally left the corporate world. And, but when you leave the guaranteed paycheck for the uncertainty of the life of a writer, which is very feast or famine, especially in the beginning, especially when you have a wife and three kids and you're trying to figure out how you're going to pay the mortgage. If I could go back and talk to that guy, and that's, we're talking about 1994, I would tell them all the cool things I've been able to do since I left that corporate job. You know, travel around the world at twice the speed of sound on the Concorde. I've um, I've been to six continents. I've I've been re arrested and thrown into an African prison. Um, mm -hmm. I spent time in the jungles of Borneo. It's just all these adventures that have come out of the fact that at some point, you, you know, with my wife standing by my side, I just chose to be a writer and ride the roller coaster and and you know have a great life and. Again, but I'd like to go back and tell that guy, calm down. It's going to be okay. You're going to do some cool stuff. 
or you're going to pay the bills. You're going to get to keep writing for the rest of your life, but you just, you know, enjoy it and, and don't be so anxious. So, you know, again, looking back over the books that you've published, um, you seem like you've spent a, a good amount of time in World War II, which obviously is a fascinating time period. But is that your favorite historical time period? It's, it's one of them. I don't, I don't, I, hmm, that's a good question. I, I really didn't write about World War II until I think Patton, which was, which was 2014. That would have been the fourth book in the Achilles series. Um, but I, you know, I've been back to it several times since, but um, it's not that I have a favorite time in history. I mean, I have several I have favorite places. I, I love London. I love Paris. I like to write about the things that happened there. I'd love to be able to go back and write a great piece about um, medieval times, or I'd like to be able to write a great piece about maybe the Civil War. So it's not really the places that I've written about that are my, you know, my favorites periods in history. It's the places that I am curious about. And that's what kind of drives me as an historian is I'm, I'm just deeply curious about history. I want to piece together all the, the jigsaw pieces, you know, into, into understand the puzzle a lot better, which it's, you know, you can't know everything about history, but at the same time, I think the better informed you are, the more fun it is, because when you visit a great museum or you visit a, a battlefield, you you understand what happened there. You understand um, all the nuances of, of what happened, and it makes everything, even you know the ghosts of the battlefield, it makes you understand them just a little bit better. Is there a particular historical figure you're drawn to? Uh, my favorite is Captain James Cook. Um, I wrote about him. A long time ago but he's he's kind of stayed with me i just i like that he was an average guy he was you know he he joined the royal navy as just basically at the lowest possible level then he rode all rose, rose all the way up to his captain you know he had this epic career he did amazing things on his explorations but at the same time he um he died a horrible death um i'm just i'm just fascinated by him and he's one of those guys that he's not going to sell a lot of books. You know, I've written about him once. I can't see myself going back to writing about him again, but at the same time, he's one of those characters that stays with you long after you wrote about him. Do you read your own reviews? <laughs> sometimes, sometimes I try not to do too much of the Amazon clickbait because that can, you never know what you're going to get because if sometimes people are just, you know, maybe they don't like Bill, for instance, and they're going to attack the book because they, they think that, you know, the bill has something to do with it or, 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 you know, people just like to make a name for themselves and they get a little bit malicious, but yeah, I read, you know, and I, I try not to do it too much, but I go on Goodreads and I go on Amazon. If there's a nice newspaper review, I'll read it. Um, you know, the thing about reviews is very rarely uh, do they offer constructive criticism, you, you know, very, you know, usually it's, it's not through with an agenda who's trying to make his point by using your book is something to skewer. Um, and the thing about it is you can have a thousand good reviews, a thousand five star. We love you. You're the best. I want to buy all your books. And it just takes one shitty part of my language review. to just, it stays with you for years. It's like, why bother? But at the same time, I think it's human nature to want to go look. Sure. I'm curious, do you ever, are you ever, ever able to glean anything from them that you find useful? I, I can literally honestly say I've never read anything from a review that made me want to change a single sentence I've written. I mean, and, I, and I'm speaking very honestly about that. It's, um, I think you at some point, you, you make choices in your work. You, there's a, every, being a writer is being a decision maker. You know, it's, what am I going to write about? What's the first paragraph going to be? What's the first word going to be? Uh, what's the next chapter? It's it's always decisions. And so you have to be able to defend those des decisions and be comfortable with them because when you write a book, you're living with each decision or however long it takes you to write that book. So when it finally comes out and somebody else doesn't like your decision, well, you know, that's them. They should write their own book and make that decision for them because it's going to work better for them than for me. Well, and you described a very deliberate process in how you make your decisions and how you choose your words and how you structure your books. So it, it's clear to me that there's a lot of uh, forethought that goes into it in both the writing and the rewriting process. 
You know, it's funny. Um, if there is a miserable part about being a writer, it's it's when you commit to a book and you know starts it takes root in your the core of your being and you dream about it. You 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 go to a concert, you go to a you know, you go to dinner, you're thinking about it, you're thinking about the characters here. So those decisions we're talking about um are you're you're always thinking about what's next and, and we're in you know okay i plan to go here but maybe that's not the best place let's go here instead and that kind of stuff just it really it that's that's the hardest part for me about being a writer is that constant um question self self uh discovery to make sure that i'm making the right decisions because if you make the wrong decision you might go down that path for 60 pages and only late, later realize wrong that's the wrong path we have to go delete those 60 pages and start over again and nobody wants to do that you made reference to another taking book for next year yes can you uh, say any more about it uh, i cannot tell you the title it's another world war ii book i think we're going to stay with world war ii maybe for a few taking books um tremendously excited about it like i said i just spent some time tromping all over europe you know literally I think I just went to seven countries in 12 days, but uh, it's, you know, taking Paris to me was such a labor of love. I was so passionate about it. I really, I really invested myself in it in a way that I really didn't know that I could invest myself in a book. And I did, I'm, I'm so happy for it. So the next thing is at some point I've got to like set it aside, you know, obviously keep publicizing and keep trying to sell books, but at the same time I need to, invest my heart now in another project and and it, it, it's just my nature i'm very competitive i want to make the next book better than taking paris so that's the challenge before me well and you know i, I have to say i really have liked the active verb in the title taking oh. paris <laughs> and, and, and in the killing titles you know killing this person that person so on and so forth you know there's it's a, they're they're very descriptive titles and i'm curious you know i know some authors have more of a say in that than others do you um did were you able to choose the title for this series of books i did i, I actively um it, it's something you talk about this i've heard a lot of jokes about when are we going to have the you know the the f word series <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's like i don't think that's coming but uh i did i, I actively wanted to pivot away from the killing series, but I, I like, cause you know, taking Paris like the, like the killing books is written in the present tense. And I think when you use a very active word in the, in the title, in the, in the title, it kind of alerts the reader like, Hey, th this is going to be action. We're going to, we're going to move. You're going to, you're going to be there with the characters. You're going to be in the moment. So when I was looking for something, I didn't want something that was passive. I wanted something that, made me excited to write it and i think with taking the cool thing about it is it it lets me go th anywhere in history and it also too and it doesn't just need to be a city for instance right. it, it could it could be it can be an, an individual it can be a battle i'm just i'm looking forward to seeing where this goes yeah you're absolutely right it could be it could be a person it could be a place it could be yeah. a thing yeah so um it's very exciting you know it's it's in and the the trick is going to be making everything again rise up off the page and 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 make the the next book better than the present book and as long as you keep doing that and have that hunger for it it's a lot of fun okay i've got some questions here that i want to share that we've that i've gotten in the chat um i truly enjoy the short chapters presentation what type of feedback do you receive on that approach i think it makes the book move along so well and keeps the story alive I've heard some people say that it leaves them wanting more. And, and, and again, it goes back to that decision making process. I feel like every chapter as long as it, it is as long as it needs to be. And I, I have found that I can say as much in 2000 words as I can say in 5000. In other words, if I take 5000 words and I kind of don't make it tight and fast paced, it, you know, I can do 5,000 words for a chapter, but at the same time, if I just cut it down and if I make it really move, I think the reader enjoys it more. And I, and so when people say they want to learn more about it, like, oh, th this chapter left me asking a lot of questions, that's great. 
you know, literally, if you want to know more about that, you know, it, go find a book about that and really dig into it because, you know, these chapters, because they're so, because they're short and there's, you know, I don't know how many chapters, there, there's a bunch. Um, every one of them is a, is, a, is a part of that jigsaw puzzle we talked about. And the whole idea is to make each chapter not be its own, you know, beacon of knowledge, but the, the every chapter supports every other chapter. And that's what I like about the shorter chapters. So another another comment is this uh, person's a big fan of the Killing series, and they're curious how you pick the subjects. You've gone from killing Jesus and Kennedy to killing the mob, which is a pretty broad range. What makes a topic qualify, if you will? Um, I have nothing to do with that. Uh, seriously, honestly, Bill, uh, when I got hired to work with Bill for the for, for killing Lincoln, it was supposed to be a one-off, and it was a huge success. And Bill called me about five weeks after it came out and said, "Hey, we're going to do killing Kennedy." And I said, "That's fantastic. Let's you know we're 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 going into the deep dive as far as um, conspiracy theories. So that's great." And then we finished that, and he called me and goes, "Let's do killing Jesus." And I thought, "Oh, okay," because I thought we we're going to go maybe towards McKinley or Garfield or somebody like that. Um, so I like that he did that. And then with Patton, you know, and, and Bill's always thinking about these things. So he, you know, in the way that we structured these, you know, to go to like for Reagan, for instance, you know, that was, that was kind of a, a gray area because of his mental health issues. And, and then to go to England and the rising sun, you know, great history, you know, just waiting to be told is a, is a, is a fascinating story. And just trusting, I, th I think this night, so testimony to Bill that he, he found, he trusted in these topics enough in our ability to tell these stories well, and in knowing that there was rich detail in all these stories that would really make it interesting. Um, and they, they have worked. If there hasn't been a one that hasn't made the New York Times bestseller list. One of my favorite elements of your books is the context you provide for these significant events or personalities. Taking Paris, a topic I was familiar with, however, you gave us a feel for how this event was linked to daily happenings and the details of the day, along with the big strategic picture. Would you like to comment on that? I have, actually, I think that was one of my favorite. Um, yeah, like I said before, sometimes in new research, you have to leave yourself open to find these these stories and if I had outlined this book beforehand and started talking about, for instance, when I talk about the resistance and the progression of the resistance within Paris, and you have these people who were just patriots who had no military training, they had no weapons really, and they just put themselves out there. And then to you know find these stories of you know people who um, you stood before a firing squad because they wouldn't give up the name of a friend who had insulted a German officer in, or, or, or these people who stood before a firing squad because they were um, betrayed by somebody that they trusted. And when you, when, when you don't just look at, when you don't, don't just tell it as a tragedy, but you get to know these people and you go into their lives and, and again, it's, again, it's one of the things, you know, you take, you take a character, you, you say, okay, you can, you can say he, this happened, but then, okay, what do he look like? What, what, uh, what was his background? Was he ever in the military? You know, what, you know, what was his profession? What led him to make the choices he made? And in instances, one of my favorite characters was Virginia Hall, the, who I called the restless woman with one leg. She's a, an American who went to work spying for the British. She had blown her leg off accidentally several years before in a hunting accident. So she had a wooden leg and she became the most successful, successful spy on either side in World War II. And, and she's one of those characters who's kind of getting a little bit of notoriety right now, but she's largely been lost to history. And to be able to find her, sister, her story and tell it and weave it in and out in the context of the entire book was super fun because every time I came back to her, I was happy to see her again. And I wanted to just make her story richer and, and fuller and, and more exciting. So what do you read when you're not writing or researching? You know, I read spy thrillers, you know, just because when I read, when I'm writing a book like Taking Paris, it, it's, it's so intense. It's so completely, um, I'm, I'm so, you know, I'm so lost in, 
in the details. I literally mentally transport myself back to 1940, 1941, 1942. So the six hours a day that I'm writing, I'm not living in the present. I'm living someplace else. So I think for my own mental health, when I get done with a really intense book like this, um, I I just, I basically want stuff where I, can, I don't have to think. I just, I read really good, I, I read spy thrillers. I like John Le Carre a lot, and he, he's, he doesn't fall into the category not of not having to think, because I like the way he, he has like these insights and nuances, but for the most part, I just, I just read Jason Bourne style thrillers because it reminds me of the importance of pacing. Uh, there's little, you know, if you're doing a series of books, if you have a character that you're following for three or four or five books, um, I like the way that authors will bring back minor characters two or three times over the course of those series. It's just little stuff like that. It's just, I love to read. I, I mean, I was, I was, when I was a kid, I was, I was every bit of a normal kid. I played Little League and I, you know, swam and Boy Scouts and all that kind of stuff. But I also was a huge closet reader. I mean, I read, I won my local library reading contest one summer by reading over 300 books in a summer. So I just love to read and I've always, I've got books stashed all over the house. But for the most part, if I'm not writing a history book, I'm not reading history. Makes sense. Well, I want to let you know that we're going to be giving away some copies of Taking Paris to Soldiers and Families. So thank you for sending us some autographed book plates that we can add to that. And I want to also extend a personal invitation once we get back in the business of doing events in person so that we'd like to welcome you to Fort Knox for a future book. Robert, I, I would love that. I would, I would, I will take you up on that. I'm Michael Steinmacher. You've been listening to our discussion with Martin Dugard, the number one New York Times bestselling author. His newest book is Taking Paris. Thank you. Hope you'll join us again.